All right, um, I will introduce this program with a very short talk that I call Love and Panic. Um, why do we call this Love and Panic? Because those seem to be the dominant feelings that we have about our children. We love our kids very deeply and we find them sensitive and sweet, exasperating and extraordinary, uh, but we're also panicked about their futures. I mean, I'll take a poll. Parents, caregivers, who here is panicked to at least some degree about your children's futures? <laughs> I have two, so I'm double panicked. Um, that's my daughter, Sophie, who's nine. That's my son, Johnny, who's 16. By the way, I'm told that this light cannot be turned off. So I really, I, I'm sorry about that. We will turn it off during the video portions at least. Um, I don't know why that is, but, but it, oh, there you go. Okay. And that way you don't have to see me either. Um, so um, how can our children live safe and fulfilling adulthoods? Where can they possibly live? Will they be neglected and abused? Who will watch over them when we no longer can? Um, you know, my children are hardly alone. Uh, they are just two of a very rapidly growing and unprecedented population of young people who will need daily, often 24-7 care for the rest of their lives. And, you know, I know data is boring, and somebody walked up to me, and she's like, I already know what you're going to say, Jill. <laughs> like, yeah, and here I'm about to say it. So <laughs> she's memorized my speech for me. Um, so um, data is boring, but it's important to know what's going on. It's really important for everyone in this room and for everyone outside of this room to know what's going on in California, at least. Um, this is autism cases by birth year. Oh, you fixed the light. Um, and um, it shows that we have very few autism births through about 1980-81. And then there's a little inflection point, and then a near exponential growth, right, through today. There's not actually a drop-off at the end. That's just the lag in cases entering the system. So there used to be about 200 autism births per year. We're now at about 5,000 births per year, uh, feeding, feeding just into the DDS system. That doesn't even count. Um, the uh, you know, non-DDS autism cases, which are probably at least 50% of the autism cases in the state. So what does this mean? How does it translate for adults? That's the theme of our conference, right? Our adults. Uh, it translates into this, that in today we have about 14,000 adults in the state with aut DDS autism. In five years, we'll double that to about 28,000. In 10 years, we'll triple that to about 42,000. In 20 years, we'll have about 100,000 100, cases. Um, so uh, you know, some people say, oh, that's better awareness. It's broader, broadening criteria. It's you know, changing diagnostics. And I'm like, no, it's not. Actually, in the DDS system, it's not. We've been raising eligibility, not lowering it, right? Um, the people who have been entering the system are the young people, not the older people. There's not a hidden group of adults in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s with DDS eligible autism who haven't been identified. They don't exist. So this is a real phenomenon that's happening and it's really unfortunate to me, and in fact kind of disastrous, that there seems to be this perpetual media myth about this being about um, better awareness. We know it definitely is not. Um, so this is an unprecedented problem, and our society has never had so many seriously developmentally disabled people or young adults before. Um, so what's the answer? What are we going to do? I mean, I, I don't think we as a society have come remotely close to grips with about, wh about what we're going to do with this problem. My timers? Okay, I'm okay. <laughs> um, so there is really only one answer to this massive conundrum, and that's the title of this program. The title is, that's the original artwork, uh, we have to let a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, that's the answer. We don't have a choice. We have to uh, cultivate and encourage the development of really, you know, probably at least a thousand, you know, new programs, whether they be, uh, you know, day programs, employment programs, housing. Uh, we need to open the floodgate to innovation and options. That is our belief, and um, there are those who actually don't agree with us, a few of them, um, but uh, we firmly believe that that's the case. Um, so what are the forces working against us? There's the dead flowers. <laughs> um, you know, first, as I said, there's shockingly little acknowledgement about what is happening. Um, you know, we, 
we have a kind of complacency in academia, in the Department of Public Health, even in DDS, about this astronomical um, growth in this condition. Second, our budget, as you will hear throughout today, is really past the breaking point, our developmental services budget. Um, providers are being forced out of business and no new money is coming in to create new programs. Um, we tried to get a 10% increase, which is a pretty modest increase, added to the budget. And um, even that you know, has, has so far not gained any traction. Um, third, our Medicaid system, which funds much of our disability supports, um, is threatening to erect formidable barriers to autism-friendly housing and program solutions. Um, that's in the name of civil rights. If anything looks too disability-friendly, you know, it comes under scrutiny you know, for being exclu you know, exclusionary or uh, you know, somehow um, away from the community. And uh, that really works to the detriment, especially for people with uh, more severe needs and more intensive uh, support needs. Uh, fourth, housing. Uh, what housing? Uh, we closed the institutions, which is great, uh, but we never bothered to create a housing plan. And thank you. Uh, California has shifted the burden of finding housing to us, the consumers. And of course, we live in a spectacularly costly area. Uh, and now let's say you actually get funding to start housing or a program or a project. Well, then you're highly vulnerable to permit delays, to lawsuits, to all sorts of red tape that could prevent you from getting uh, what you need. Sixth, um, if you're autistic but not deemed severe enough to get into the system, remember, it's really hard to get into the DDS system now. Um, you might be functionally rather disabled, but um, not um, open to uh, the kind of uh, you know, support systems that you, that you will need for the rest of your life. Um, and finally, our, our regional center system is broken, and they admit that. They say that they're completely overburdened. Here's a caseworker here. She has 100 cases on her docket. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I have two autistic kids. I can't manage two autistic kids. Now try to imagine having the, you know, the role to supervise 100 of them. Um, okay, so we will not have all the answers to these problems today. I wish we would, but we won't. But clearly we need sweeping reform, both at the state and federal levels. Um, but we can at least try to add clarity to this problem and at least start working on solutions. And that's, I believe, what's happening today.